Well, thank you very much. Uh, I'm honored to give this talk. Um, you know, uh, we all knew Louis Pasteur, who is the father of modern medicine, because he popularized the germ theory uh, in the treatment of disease. <clears throat> he had a great expression. He said, chance favors only the prepared mind. And that happened to me, Guinness knows. I grew up in the Southwest, in Louisiana, Oklahoma, and Texas. In 1950, I went to Princeton University, where I played mediocre football. But I realized several things there. They, they taught me the value of critical thinking, of always to think about what people are telling you. <clears throat> also, I realized there that I was much more comfortable with concrete uh, things than as esoteric things. So. I got my degree in engineering, <clears throat> very concrete. I also got my pilot's license in the Princeton Flying Club. And then, like all people of my generation, I went in the Army for two years. I was stationed in a concern outside of Nuremberg, Germany. And finally, in 1960, uh, at the age of 28, <clears throat> I was very lucky to get into the College of Physicians and Surgeons up at Columbia an excellent medical school, and it still is a very good medical school. And then I did my orthopedic training there, and that was the heyday of that department. They had guys like Charlie Neer, David Green, as in Rockwood and Green, Bob Navizer, many very, very smart people there. So I had a very excellent training in orthopedic surgery. <clears throat> and then I did a children's fellowship and went into practice in the Midtown uh, New York on the west side, two blocks from Lincoln Center, <clears throat> with J.C. Parks and Peter Lamont, who, who were the doctors for the Mets baseball team. <clears throat> and I was seeing uh, dancers on a regular basis, and then all of a sudden, <clears throat> in 1972, I got a call from George Balanchine, and he wanted to know if I would be interested in taking care of the New York City Ballet. And I said, of course, indeed, I would be interested. I was very interested. <clears throat> and he says, OK, why don't we do that? So uh, Balanchine was one of the great artistic geniuses of the 19th century. Uh, he was of Georgian extraction. <clears throat> he was also born, he was born in St. Petersburg in 1904, and he died in New York in 1983. As I said, he was one of the true geniuses uh, of, of art, not only in his century, but maybe, maybe also on the level uh, with Mozart and Balanchine. He was fully trained as a, a concert pianist in the conservatory in St. Petersburg, and he was also trained as, uh, in ballet. <clears throat> and his famous expression was, see the music and hear the dance. I was his personal physician for the, uh, till the end of his life, and we used to have dinner together, and I would ask him sort of dumb questions like, Mr. B, how do you do those beautiful ballets? And he'd say, well, Bill, he said, for me, it's easy. He said, I hear beautiful music, and I can see people dancing. So I go up to the studio, and I have them do what I saw them doing when I heard the music, right? Very simple. <clears throat> He left the, uh, Russia in 1924 at the age of 20. Uh, that was the year that Lenin died. And he went to Paris and, and met Diaghilev, who immediately hired him to be his youngest choreographer uh, for the Ballet Russe de Monte Carlo. <clears throat> that was a great era for, for uh, Balanchine between 1924 and 1929 when Diaghilev died of, of uh, diabetes. And ironically, 1929 was the year that Banning and Best uh, discovered insulin. <clears throat> and this was a great era for him. This is a great picture of him in Monte Carlo. And in the background is Diaghilev. <clears throat> he eventually came to New York uh, and started the New York City Ballet. And he originated, he didn't originate, but he popularized neoclassical ballet. Now, what is neoclassical ballet? Well, <clears throat> classical ballet is Swan Lake and Sleeping Beauty and, and Les Sylphides and Romeo and Juliet. These are all operatic ballets that last three or four acts. 
they're, they're, they're great if you like that kind of thing, but they, they have stories and pantomime and scenery and elaborate costumes and lots of standing around and, <clears throat> and not so much dancing, but the dancing that's there is very, very good. But Balanchine said, no, you don't need all of that. You just need beautiful music, pretty dancers that are well-trained and they're, they're and doing choreography that's completely tied to the music. He really meant that the, the, in his ballets, the music could, should come to life on stage. <clears throat> it's an extra dimension to his work. And it was. His ballets became very, very popular in, in the, uh, that decade from 1972 to 1982 was, was the heyday of the New York City Ballet. Between Balanchine and uh, Jerry Robbins, the other choreographer, <clears throat> there was a masterwork almost every year in the theater. There was electricity, there was this excitement about what's gonna happen next. <clears throat> and there's a picture of me. Uh, on the right is Peter Martins, uh, a Danish dancer who took over the New York City Ballet when Balanchine died and he still runs it very well, by the way. And there's Malanchine in the middle, and there I am with, with uh, Colleen Neary, the dancer. And his ballets an hour danced all over the world. Uh, in 1978, Baryshnikov, who had defected from Russia, joined the New York City Ballet. And here's Balanchine uh, coaching him in his ballet, The Prodigal Son. I'm sure they had great plans to do things together because they were both Russian and, and they had the soul together. But at that, in the late 70s, Balanchine's health began to deteriorate. In 1978, uh, he had a triple bypass operation and he was bothered by dizziness and unsteadiness at that time. <clears throat> and in 1980, uh, Misha decided to move on. Uh, he was disappointed because of Balanchine's deteriorating health. Um, and he did, then took over this, the uh, directorship of the second major company in, in America, the ballet, American Ballet Theater. <clears throat> and that's spelled the English way, T-H-E-A-T-R-E. -E. And he asked me when he did that if I would be willing to take over his company too. And I said, I'd be glad to do it. And so that way <clears throat> I became... Uh, the doctor for ABT also. Balanchine's health tended to incline. He was bothered by dizziness and we, he had several major workups. We never could figure out what was wrong with him. <clears throat> I was his doctor. He, he went slowly downhill in spite of all efforts and eventually died in 1983. And his post-mortem showed that he had Jakob Kreutzfeldt's disease, which is a form, a human form of mad cow disease. And I felt a little better in the fact that nobody could have saved him. So in his, in his obituary in the New York Times, they, they stated that they predicted that three greatest men of the 19th century in the arts uh, would be Pablo Picasso, Stravinsky, and Balanchine. They said because each of them brought their art form out of the 19th century into the 20th century, and moved it forward in a different direction with a new emphasis. <clears throat> so that's how I became an orthopedist for the New York City Ballet, a school of American Ballet, uh, American Ballet Theater, the Jacqueline Onassis School at the ABT, and eventually the doctor for, for a uh, consultant for uh, Alvin Ailey and then sports teams for a while. I was a consultant for both, a foot and ankle consultant for both the Yankees and the, and the Knicks. <clears throat> and in the 80s, two wonderful things happened. First of all, I met my lovely wife, Linda, whom I married. Uh, she danced with the New York City Ballet for 18 years <clears throat> and then got her PhD in clinical psychology. And she practices that today. She has a practice in uh, psychological problems and performing artists. And then Francesca Thompson joined us in about 1975 until her untimely death in 1996 of a my, multiple myeloma. And Francesca drew me more and more into foot and ankle because most dance injuries involve foot and ankle problems. 
Uh, and together, Francesca and I, in that decade, described the, and popularized the modified Brosen procedure for foot and ankle instability. We started using this early in about 1980 because it was a perfect operation for dancers. Uh, the dancer's tendonitis of the flexor hallucis longus, posterior impingement on the ostrigonum, uh, the so-called dancer's heel, the dancer's stress fracture at the base of the second metatarsal, the dancer's spiral oblique fracture of the fifth metatarsal, the un in early instabilities in the second MP joint, and now this has gotten an awful lot of attention. And finally, in 1997, we won the uh, first Roger Mann Award for the interposition arthroplasty. Also, we were aware of the dangers of hypermobility. <clears throat> All of these dancers are flexible because you can't do this stuff if, without being flexible. And there's a fine line between flexible and hypermobile. The joint hypermobility syndrome, which sometimes called the BJA, benign joint hypermobility syndrome, because studies have shown that hypermobile dancers tend to be frequently injured and they tend to have short careers. And some studies showed that they had low pain threshold. One study showed that they needed more Novocaine in the dentist's office, not because they're wimps, but because it's all part of the syndrome. <clears throat> so we tried to identify this early by screening in dancers. And we put them on strengthening exercises, <clears throat> usually Pilates, uh, because Pilates is wonderful. It allows them to exercise in their position of function. And hope, we hope that, that by doing that, that they'll have fewer injuries and longer careers. And that's not proven, but we hope it will be. And this eventually led to my presidency in the AOFAS in 1993 to 1994. That was about the time of, of uh, Hillary Care. And, and my address uh, was entitled, Batten Down the Hatches, There's Storm Clouds on the Horizon. And that was prescient. Uh, and they've continued till today. And the great men of that era, uh, uh, I became good friends with, Roger Mann, Ken Johnson, Mike Coughlin, Luke Bordelone, Don Baxter, Mark Myerson, Jim Nunley, Tom Clanton, John Gould, and my fellow Marty O'Malley that wrote so many papers with me on the dance injuries. <clears throat> now, if you keep your mind open, there, there's always something new. And that's especially true with the dancers because they have these minor syndromes. They have basically the same injuries that athletes have, but they have them in obscure locations. And you have to understand the altered kinesiology that's involved in what they do to explain their injuries. Uh, it's important to remember, I think, that, that, that dancers are not artistic athletes. They're primarily <clears throat> athletic artists because they're artists first and they're athletes second. So this comment came up recently, something we're working on. I call it the nutcracker fracture. Or it's caused by tight toe shoes. <clears throat> now Marty O'Malley and I described uh, this paper in, uh, in 1996 of uh, stress fractures at the base of the second metatarsal in dancers. Now these are very, very common, <clears throat> but they're horizontal. This is one, an untreated one for a year, a, a bad example of this fracture. It's extremely common in dancers. We see two or three of them every week, uh, or stress reactions, stress fractures. And what I'm talking about is if you take a wide shoe and you put it in a toe shoe, and it's the kind of foot where the base of the first and second metatarsals come together, this can cause a very specific fracture there this <clears throat> oblique fracture. It's not horizontal, it's oblique. And it's caused by <clears throat> impingement at the pace of the first web space. Uh, <clears throat> now, <clears throat> often seen in young dancers with bunions in tight shoes who have not resized their toe shoes as they grow. Sometimes it's even seen in dancers in the early 30s. <clears throat> Probably won't occur in this foot because uh, there's no impingement at the base of the first web space. 
Here's one in the, a very famous ballerina in Vienna, Austria, who had this for a year, and she was be treat, being treated by anti-inflammatory pills. Uh, and it's, you can't see the impingement because she's not in the toe shoe. Now, bunions, uh, just as a side, bunions are, are no more common in ballet dancers than they are in the general population. This was proven by a very good study done in Sweden where they're very good at studies like this because they know where everybody is from the minute they're born to the minute that they die. And they said the, the incidence of bunions was no higher in ballet dancers, so you can't blame bunions on the toe shoe. It's your grandmother that causes bunions, not the toe shoe. But the point is you never want to operate on a bunion in a serious dancer because they need about 110 degrees of dorsiflexion in that joint to do the demi-point releve. And there's no way in the world you're going to do a bunion on a dancer and end up with that kind of motion. So you have to tell the serious dancers. Now, if they're hobby dancers, that's okay. But you have to tell a serious dancer, especially a, a professional dancer, don't have your bunions operated on until you retire. Because, because after the surgery, you'll be able to choreograph and you'll be able to demonstrate, but you won't be able to perform professionally. Now, it can occur in a foot without a metatarsus primus varus. Here, here's a, an example. You can see it down there at the base of the first web space. We, we also had one in a non-dancer. Uh, for 10 years, I did pro bono work up at West Point. And they had a, the center on their basketball team had one of these that healed and then it refractured. And then in the summer, we went into the first web space and removed that impingement and it never happened to him again. Now, the, the ballet toe shoe is a straight last show, toe shoe. There's no right or left, but you can tell which is right and which is left because it wears out under the big toe. And, and they always have a little valgus in the forefoot because that improves their line. They're very conscious of their line when they move and stand, and there's always a little valgus in the forefoot, even on demi-point or point. And you can see it here just when they're saying every one of these uh, girls has their foot turned out into valgus. So dance medicine, uh, I say always, is uh, fame without fortune. If you want to make a lot of money, don't go into dance medicine because uh, the, I read the other day their, their average salary in this country is $17 an hour. Now that's hardly better than the people that flip burgers, but that's what they make and they love what they do and they wouldn't do anything else. And they're wonderful, wonderful patients if you understand them and if they trust you. It's, and it's, it's really mostly the practice of general orthopedics, and that's fine. We were all trained as general orthopedists, and you don't need to leave all of that training behind. And it's very interesting to treat the dancers for back problems, hip problems, knee problems, and mostly the foot. What you need to do is what I did. Uh, for the first five years, I went over to the, uh, Lincoln Center every weekend and watched Balancing's classes. You can call the director of the local ballet company. They'll be glad to tell if, if you're just interested. They like people that are interested in what they do. And so go to ballet class and ask them. They, they, they're friendly. Ask, and learn all the steps and the motions so you can speak the language that they do and you can understand what, what they mean when they tell you that I was doing a, a, a soda basque or something and, and they'll know what, what exactly what that was. It's very important also to work with the physical therapist to take care of it because the physical therapists are the first person that they go to when they're injured. And if you have a connection with them, then, then uh, the physical therapist can refer the injured dancer to you. And this is uh, very, very important. And these are great people, but not everybody was meant to do this stuff. In my mind, uh, uh, classical ballet is probably the most beautiful thing that you can do with the human body because it also involves the music. It's not just what they do, it's, it's what they do with the music that's played. So dance medicine is incredibly rewarding in a, uh, in a very silent way. To be in the theater and see a dancer a dance whom you operated on and everything else is very rewarding in, internally. So there's a lot of silent reward in working with them. They're wonderful, grateful, grateful patients. 
So you have to have an inquiring mind. You have to think about what's going on and question what you're being told. And as I said early today, you've got to think outside the box. There's a great story in one of the TED lectures that I watched in preparation for this about the little girl in the art class who's over in the corner working by herself and the art teacher says to her, what are you working on? And she says, I'm drawing a picture of God. And the art teacher says, well, you know, we don't really know what God looks like. And she says, you will in a minute. <laughs> so chance does prefer the prepared mind. Uh, so uh, be ready when you have an opportunity because it may take you in places like me. It may take you in places that you never dreamed of. And so you, you should pursue your opportunities when they happen. Thank you very much. I'm trying, I'm trying. Thank you. Dr. Hamilton, thank you so much for that reflection and the contribution you've made to orthopedics and dance medicine and contributing to opening the TED sessions for us in that manner. It was fantastic.